We've been fighting a long time, and we have all lost so very much, so many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. You have no idea how important you are. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Ave Maricela Dei Mater Alma Ad Semper Virgo Felix Semiporta Hello darkness, my old friends. I've come to talk with you again. Because the vision softly creeping left its seeds while I was sleeping. And the vision that was planted in my brain still remains within the sound of silence. I won't, I won't be winning a Grammy anytime soon, but I want to do a thing on the, the, the book Power of Silence. And uh, also, well, you know, that that's from the, uh, the Sound of Silence by Simon Garfunkel. And Garfunkel said that that was Art, Gar Art Garfunkel during a live performance said, this is a song about the inability of people to communicate with each other. I'm just giving the context of the song on it. Uh, also said this topic is present from the first universally known verse, Hello Darkness, my old friend. The author has no one to talk to but the dark, to whom he tells almost like a confession about a dream he had. The first theme of the vision is loneliness. The narrator finds himself walking alone on a narrow path when the cold night is suddenly lit up by a flash of a neon light. He is dazzled by it, and we are told that the glare is icy, naked, and unnatural. The neon conveys the idea of cold modernity, serving as a symbol for a present-day industrial society, which has replaced the traditional warmth of the fireplace bearer of communion and togetherness with the impersonality of artificial light. And there's part of it that he says that it's a uh, television because I was in the sixties. By that time, the song came out, 90% of people had a TV and you can look, think of stuff like uh, the people bowed and prayed to the neon God they made, uh, bow down to the, their television, not worship in a sense, but just bow down to it. And you can think about that with cell phones. Now, I mean, people, you get a beep, beep, you know, they bow down, they look down to their cell phone. They, Almost bow down, you know, reverently almost to it, and check it out. And uh, it was the words on the prophets are written on the subway walls, advertising, billboards, advertising. The prophets are telling you what to do, how to do it, what to buy, how to think. Uh, and the but the whole thing is supposed to be like someone that's you know a social outcast ideal. They you know like uh, uh, was the one part. Uh, fools say, I do, you do not know, silence like a cancer grows. Uh, it's just like uh, if you see something's going on and you're silent about it, it's, that silence continues to go. I mean, you know that from the last few years. Not many people spoke out or they were silenced. But that silence, you know, I was scared to say anything. That silence was like a cancer kept on going. And you see that in a lot of spaces, even in the church today. A lot of signs. We're just not going to be. We're just going to be quiet about this. We're not going to say anything about. It. We're not going to make waves. We're not going to rattle the cage because we, maybe we'll get a uh, we'll get uh, pushed aside or attacked or silenced or silenced in a sense. Um. But yeah, I mean, you could also see stuff like you know, uh, in the sense of prayer, in the sense, in the way of people talking without speaking, people hearing without listening, people writing songs that voices never shared. And no one dared disturb the sound of silence. But also in the context of the song, it's talking about, you know, turn on, turn the computer, uh, turn the TV on. People talking without speaking, people hearing without listening, people writing songs that never voices never shared. It's uh, uh, artificial, uh, and then people did not want to dare disturb the the silent of that. But it's again, it's just in the modern in the in the secular way. It's been in, just being by yourself, not wanting to get out there and uh, meet other people or help other people or do anything about something. You just kind of like complain in your own, maybe tweet about it all the time. I don't like this, but you're not going to do anything about it. You're going to say something without speaking. 
And people listen without hear, without hearing. They're reading what you're saying. And that's all you got. Not disturbing, this, not disturbing anything else besides being silent in the sense of, I'm going to put a tweet or text out there, not talking to anybody. Uh, but yeah, you can also bring that in the, yeah, in a secular, in a, in, a, in a religious way, you can see how that could be prayer too. People talking without speaking, people hearing without listening. And we'll get into that with the the book, The Power of Silence. And yes, I did make this video, the, the part in the bottom right hand corner, a little darker to go in the darkness of the photo. And, you know, hello, darkness, my old friend. Yeah, so it's, I'm weird like that, okay? Just deal with me. If you're listening on a podcast, you, you don't know, you may have to check the YouTube to see that what I'm talking about. So anyway, right off the bat, the introduction. Why did Robert Cardinal Seurat decide to devote a book to silence? We spoke for the first time about this beautiful subject in April 2015. We were returning to Rome after spending several days in the Abbey of La Grasse at that magnificent monastery located between Carcassonne and Narbonne. The Cardinal paid a visit to his friend, Brother Vincent. Shattered by multiple sclerosis, the young religious knew that he was reaching the end of his life. In the prime of life, he found himself paralyzed, confined to his bed in the infirmary, condemned to merciless medical pro protocols. The smallest breath was an immense effort for him. On this earth, Brother Vincent Marie of the Resurrection was already living in the grand silence of heaven. I remember thinking when I first read that, it's just the second paragraph of the book, in the intro. Uh, if you ever seen the music video for Metallica 1, uh, the whole song is about this guy that got his arms blown off, legs blown off, he's blinded, he, he can't hear, he can't see, he's got, he has no limbs, so he can't touch, he can't, do, he can't communicate at all. And he's hooked up to all these devices, and he's pretty much just begging, you know, please, you know, take, you know, take my life, basically. And he's he's asking to get out of this, uh, the hell he's in. He's, I think he's got a box on his head because it's just he's just mutilated from the the uh, the bomb that went off. But now I picture not that this, not that his brother was in that state, but I, it, the the way he's talked about, you know, the, he couldn't communicate at all, really, except for just looking. At least this guy could. At least his brother could see. And could you know communicate in his eyes in a sense, whereas this, the uh, the the music video option he couldn't do anything. I guess he could shake his head maybe, but he couldn't couldn't hear. Uh, their first meeting had taken place on October twenty fifth, twenty fourteen. That day left a deep impression on on Cardinal Seurat. Right away he recognized an ardent soul, a hidden saint, a great friend of God. How could anyone forget Brother Vincent's spiritual strength? His silence, the beauty of his smile, the cardinal's emotion, the tears, the modesty, the colliding sentiments. Brother Vincent was incapable of uttering a simple sentence because the sickness deprived him of the use of speech. He could only lift his gaze towards the cardinal. He could only contemplate him steadily, tenderly, lovingly. Brother Vincent's bloodshot eyes already had the brightness of eternity. The Cardinal returned several times to pray with his friend, Brother Vincent. The patient's condition kept worsening, but the quality of the silence that sealed the dialogue of a great prelate and a little monk grew in an increasingly spiritual way. When he was in Rome, the Cardinal often called the brother. The one spoke gently, and the other remained silent. Cardinal Seurat spoke again to Brother Vincent a few days before his death. He was able to hear his breathing, husky and discordant the attacks of pain, the last efforts of his heart, and to give him his blessing. On Sunday, April 10, 2016, when Cardinal Seurat had come to Argentul for the conclusion of the exhibition of the Holy Tunic of Christ, Brother Vincent gave up his soul to God, surrounded by Father Emmanuel Marie and his family. How can the mystery of Brother Vincent be understood? After so many trials, the end of his journey was peaceful. The rays from paradise passed noiselessly through the windows of his room. During the last months of his life, the little patient prayed a lot for the cardinal. The monks who cared for the brother at every moment are certain that he remained alive for a few additional months so as to protect Robert Seurat better. Brother Vincent knew that the wolves were lying in wait, that his friend needed him, 
and he was counting on him. The friendship was born in silence, it grew in silence, and it continues to exist in silence. Uh, the meetings with Brother Vincent were a fragment of eternity. We never doubted the importance of each of the minutes spent with him. Silence made it possible to raise every sentiment towards the most perfect state when it was necessary to leave the Abbey. We knew that Vincent's silence would make us stronger to confront the world's noises. The power of silence could never have existed without Brother Vincent. He showed us that the silence into which illness had plunged him allowed him to enter ever more deeply into the truth of things. God's reasons are often mysterious. Why did he decide to try so severely a young, joyful man who was asking for nothing? Why such a cruel, violent, and painful sickness? Why the sublime meeting between a cardinal who had arrived at the summit of the church and a sick person confined to his room? Silence was the salt that seasoned the story. Silence had the last word. Silence was the elevator to heaven. Who was looking for Brother Vincent? Who came to take him without a word? God. For Brother Vincent Maria, the resurrection, the program was simple. It fit into three words, God or nothing. Now, they stayed for a few days, so they caught some of the uh, nocturnal services. So it says, the prefect of the congregation for divine worship and the discipline of the sacraments was profoundly touched by the two nocturnal services that marked his stay. He shares with Isaac the Syrian this beautiful thought from the ascetical homilies. Now, St. Isaac's uh, homilies have just recently translated, I guess, within the last decade. Father Abernathy at philokaleaministries.com, I think it is, does a Lectio Divine on these homilies along with Cassian, Climac, John Climacus, etc. Now, these are our are, are, are saints. They're, People go, oh, they're Eastern. Right? No, they're ours. Before the schism, the schism wasn't until the 11th century. These guys lived way before that. They're Catholic. Now, Philip Neary, for example, he his two favorite books were John Cassian's Conferences and The uh, uh, the Latter Divine Ascent by St. John uh, Climacus. And uh, anyway, there's a lot of, uh, I think uh, Cassian was also influential to St. Dominic and obviously St. Benedict. So yeah, read these guys. These guys, I mean... And there, there are guys. We have to recapture the spirituality of the of Cassian and Climacus and the, uh, et al. As an example, of the Desert Fathers. Uh, there's some tremendous stories. It was Abbey, Abbey Moses. There's one uh, uh, Father talked about. There's you can type, type him up. You'll see the uh, the meme. The priest. There's a guy. One of the monks comes up and says he, he's worried about getting being too prayerful or something like that. And, the Abbey gets up and goes, if you will, and he puts out his hands and he goes, you can become all fire. And there's flames start coming out of his fingers. Uh, there's some cool stuff out of that. Anyways, here's the quote from St. Isaac the Syrian. Prayer offered up at night possesses a great power, more than the prayer of the daytime. Therefore, all the righteous pray during the night while combating the heaviness of the body and the sweetness of sleep and repelling corporal nature. There is nothing that even Satan fears so much as prayer that is offered during the vigilance at night. For this reason, the devil smites them with violent warfare in order to hinder them, if possible, from this work, as was the case with Anthony the Great, Blessed Paul, Arsenius, and other desert fathers. But those who have resisted his wicked stratagems even a little, who have tasted the gifts of God that are granted during vigil, and who have experienced in themselves the magnitude of God's help that is always nigh to them, utterly disdain him and all his devices, which of the solitaries, though possessing all the virtues together, could neglect this work and not be reckoned to be idle without it. For night vigil is the light of the thinking, and by it the understanding is exalted, the thought is collected, and the mind takes flight and gazes at spiritual things, and by prayer it is rejuvenated and shines brilliantly. And uh, Father goes in when he, he gets into the lecture divinity of vigils and mentions, and I think he mentions in Climacus the uh, talks as well, of how, you know, there's saints that talked about and get to get up during the night, get the whole family up, get the kids used to getting up in the middle of the night, to interrupt their sleep for a prayer. I think it's, I think he, I think Chrysostom, John Chrysostom talks about that. Uh, get up in the middle of the night to do some, do some prayers and go back to sleep. 
Let me see. For the carnal, night warms a man's heart. The one who keeps vigil at night goes out of himself, the better to find God. The silence of night is the most capable of crushing all the dictatorships of noise. When darkness descends upon the earth, the asceticism of silence can acquire more luminous dimensions. The words of the psalmist are final. In the night, I think of God and I moan. I meditate and my spirit faints. You keep my eyelids from closing. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old. I remember the years long ago. I commune with my heart in the night. I meditate and search my spirit. Psalm 77, 2 through 6. And before they left, they wanted to check out the uh, cemetery. So in the Carthusian deserts, the cemetery is located at the center of the cloister. The graves bore no names, dates, or mementos. On the one side, there were stone crosses for the generals of the order, and on the other, wooden crosses for the fathers and the lay brothers. The Carthusians are buried in the ground without a coffin, without a tombstone. No distinctive mark recalls their individual lives. He asked one of the monks uh, the location of crosses of the monks he had been contemporaries of and whose deaths he had witnessed. And the monk no, lo no longer knew, he said. He said, the gusts of wind and the mosses have already done their work. He could only find the grave of another uh, Dom, Andre Poisson, one of his predecessors, who died in April 2005. The former general died at night alone in his cell. He departed to join the sons of St. Bruno and the vast troops of hermits in heaven. Since 1084, Carthusians have not wanted to leave any trace. God alone matters. The world turns and the cross remains. A few moments later, we left the Grand Chartreuse. The Benedictine monk who had come to pick us up declared, quote, you are leaving paradise. The philosopher Joseph Rassam asserted that, quote, silence is within us. The wordless language of the finite being that by its own weight seeks and carries our movement towards the infinite being. This is to say that thought does not arrive at the affirmation of God on its own power, but through its docility to a prevalent light of being that is received and welcome as a gift. The act of silence that defines this reception bears within it prayer. In other words, the movement by which the soul raises itself to God. For Joseph or some, as for Robert Cardinal Seurat, quote, although speech characterizes man, silence is what defines him because speech acquires sense only in terms of this silence. This is the beautiful and important message of the power of silence. In this book, Robert Cardinal Seurat had only one aim, which is summed up in this thought. Silence is difficult, but it makes man able to allow himself to be led by God. Silence is born of silence. Through God, the silent one, we can gain access to silence. And man is unceasingly surprised by the light that bursts forth in. Silence is more important than any other human work, for it expresses God. The true revolution comes from silence. It leads us towards God and others so that to place ourselves humbly and generously at their service. You can think of, uh, as a part that says, the true revolution comes from silence. It's almost revolutionary to not turn on the TV, not turn on the radio. It's, uh, one priest talks about it because uh, practice this. Instead of getting in the car and immediately turning on the radio, don't turn on the radio. And I, if I traveled to Raleigh to do a conference, it's three hours away. I got up at six in the morning. I had like five hours of sleep. I had to turn on the radio to sing to myself to keep from dri from driving off the road. So there's certain things so don't go nuts on it. You know, <laughs> if you have to do it to stay awake, yeah, it's joyful too. You know, Augustine says you sing if you sing, you're praying twice. Obviously, I wasn't singing chants in the car, but uh, you get the you get the picture of that. If you're just driving down to the 7-Eleven, you don't have to turn on YouTube or the radio or anything like that. Just drive down, roll the window down if you want. Just go and come back. Just hear the wind coming through. Sit outside in the back. You don't turn the radio on. You sit out back and you listen to the birds chirp or something. Uh, it's, it's a revolutionary thing because you, you, <laughs> you get people over, you're going to have the radio. People are going to turn the radio on. You go to a restaurant, the radio's on. There's something playing. Only mom and pop shops really don't play any tunes. It might be one, you know, local, you know, diner uh, uh, dive that might not have music playing in the background. You might hear clanks of the plates and uh, 
forks and spoons, but that's about it. Anyway, at the last paragraph of the introduction, what virtue does Colonel Seurat expect from the reading of this book? Humility. From this perspective, he can adopt as his own the step taken by Raphael Cardinal Marie Delval. Having retired from the public business of the church, the former Secretary of State of St. Pius X had composed a beautiful litany of humility, which he recited every day after celebrating Mass. Uh, just reading the book, the story of Cardinal Delval is fantastic. Uh, Mediatric Press has a book on it. There's a couple other places that have different ones. But get the one that Mediatric Press has. It's a great read. Oh, Jesus, meek and humble our heart. Make my heart like yours. From self-will, deliver me, O Lord. From the desire of being esteemed, deliver me, O Lord. From the desire of being loved, deliver me, O Lord. From the desire of being extolled, deliver me, O Lord. From the desire of being honored, deliver me, O Lord. From the desire of being praised, deliver me, O Lord. From the desire of being preferred to others, deliver me, O Lord. From the desire of being consulted, deliver me, O Lord. From the desire of being approved, deliver me, O Lord. From the desire of being understood, deliver me, O Lord. From the desire to be visited, deliver me, O Lord. From the fear of being humiliated, deliver me, O Lord. From the fear of being despised, deliver me, O Lord. From the fear of suffering rebukes, deliver me, O Lord. From the fear of being calumniated, deliver me, O Lord. From the fear of being forgotten, deliver me, O Lord. From the fear of being ridiculed, deliver me, O Lord. From the fear of being suspected, deliver me, O Lord. From the fear of being wrong, deliver me, O Lord. From the fear of being abandoned, deliver me, O Lord. From the fear of being refused, deliver me, O Lord. That others may be loved more than I, Lord, grant me the grace to desire. That others may be esteemed more than I, Lord, grant me the grace to desire. That in the opinion of the world, others may increase and I may decrease, Lord, grant me the grace to desire. That others may be chosen and I set aside, Lord, grant me the grace to desire. That others may be praised and I go unnoticed, Lord, grant me the grace to desire. That others may be preferred to me in everything, Lord, grant me the grace to desire. That others may become holier than I, provide that I become as holy as I should, Lord, grant me the grace to desire. At being unknown and poor, Lord, I want to rejoice. At being deprived of the natural perfections of body and mind, Lord, I want to rejoice. When people do not think of me, Lord, I want to rejoice. When they assign to me the meanest task, Lord, I want to rejoice. When they do not even deign to make use of me, Lord, I want to rejoice. When they never ask my opinion, Lord, I want to rejoice. When they leave me at the lowest place, Lord, I want to rejoice. When they never compliment me, Lord, I want to rejoice. When they blame me in season and out of season, Lord, I want to rejoice. Blessed are those who suffer persecution for justice's sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And right off the bat, chapter 1, Robert Cardinal Seurat. 1. There is one great question. How can man really be in the image of God? Answer, he must enter into silence. God's voice is silent. Indeed, man too must seek to become silence. In speaking about Adam in paradise, St. Augustine wrote, He lived in the joy of God, and by virtue of this good, he himself was good. By living with the silent God and in him, we ourselves become silent. In his book, I Want to See God, Father Marie Eugene of the Infant Jesus writes, God speaks in silence, and silence alone seems able to express him. For the spiritual person who has known the touch of God, silence and God seem to be identified. And so does find God again. Where would he go if not to the most silent depths of his soul, into those regions that are so hidden that nothing can any longer disturb them. When he has reached there, he preserves with jealous care the silence that gives him God. He defends it against any agitation, even that of his own powers. Dom Augustin Gillerand is on the right track. What men possess in themselves, they find nowhere else. Unless silence dwells in man, and... Unless solitude is a state in which he allows himself to be shaped, the creature is deprived of God. There is no place on earth where God is more present than in the human heart. This heart truly is God's abode, the temple of silence. No prophet ever encountered God without withdrawing into solitude and silence. Moses, Elijah, and John the Baptist encountered God in the great silence of the desert. Today, too, monks seek God in solitude and silence. I am speaking not just about geographical solitude or movement, but about an interior state. It is not enough to be quiet either. 
it is necessary to become silent. For even before the desert, the solitude, and the silence, God is already in man. The true desert is within us in our soul. Strengthened with this knowledge, we can understand how silence is indispensable if we are to find God. The Father waits for his children in their own hearts. And you can think of that like uh, you don't have to go to the literal desert. Uh, St. Philip Neri called Rome his desert. Uh, and then you read the Desert Fathers, you, talk, you hear rule number one, don't leave your cell. So like, uh, like a stay-at-home mom. Not that she has, not she's in prison to the house, but you stay, you're, you're staying at the house. You're not wandering out into the desert itself or out into the open area which something could get you. You know, you might, like uh, the billboards, for example. You, you, you eliminate the billboards if you don't travel, really. It, you don't have, and yeah, I know, it's just, it's one of those, you know, it's, it's knowing what your role is, knowing what your stay life is, knowing what you're supposed to be doing. You're like, I'm not going to the bars. I'm Stay in your cell. You, do you stay at home with the family and kids or do you go to the bar and get hammered? Stay in your cell, you won't get that temptation. Or go into that vice. It's that, it's that you don't have to literally pack up the family and go to the desert to be in the desert. You can be in the middle of the desert in New York City. New York City, you can be in the desert in New York City. Just like St. Philip Neri was in the desert, he was in Rome and called it his desert. Silence is not an absence. On the contrary, it is the manifestation of a presence, the most intense of all presences. In modern society, silence has come into disrepute. This is the symptom of a serious, worrisome illness. The real questions of life are poised in silence. Our blood flows through our veins without making any noise, and we can hear our heartbeats only in silence. On July 4, 2010, in a homily for the 8th centenary of the birth of Pope Celestine V, Benedict XVI gravely insisted on the fact that, quote, we live in a society in which it seems that every space, every moment must be filled with projects, activities, and noise. There is often no time even to listen or to converse. Dear brothers and sisters, let us not fear to create silence within and outside ourselves. If we wish to be able not only to become aware of God's voice, but also to make out the voice of the person besides us, the voices of others. St. Teresa of Calcutta said poetically in her book, A Gift for God, that, quote, God is the friend of silence. See how nature, trees, flowers, grass grows in silence. See the stars, the moon, and the sun, how they move in silence. And you think about, like, uh, when people talk about space, that it's, you know, there's no noise. It's absent of noise up there. And he ends up getting into the Martha and Mary thing about the the uh, interior versus active, the contemplative versus active. And not that that Mary chose the better part, not that Martha was doing anything bad. She's a saint, a very powerful saint, if you hear a couple of the sermons on it. And uh, also you would think of uh, St. Dominic, whose feast day was the other day, when he, before he started the active order, he first set up the contemplative order. I think 10, I think Garanger writes about, it took 10 years after he set up the contemplative order to start the active order that went out to convert. So he, the interior first, then the active. He writes, It can happen that a good, pious priest, once he is raised to the Episcopal dignity, quickly falls into mediocrity and a concern for worldly success. Overwhelmed by the weight of the duties that are incumbent on him, worried about his power, his authority, and the material needs of his office, he gradually runs out of steam. And you can think of, he also says, whether as laymen, priests, or bishops, the more we need to advance in humility and to cultivate carefully the sacred dimension of our interior life by constantly seeking to see the face of God in prayer, meditation, contemplation, and asceticism, which is practice, just like a sport in sports. Anybody that's wanting to make a team or get better or work out or get make you know get better in sport, you're going to practice. You're going to eat right, think right, drink right, sleep right, work out right, practice right, practice prayer. Prayer is like practice. They practice. They, they don't still, You don't just if you're working out to get on a baseball team or basketball team. You don't practice just going through the motions. You become worse. You have to think about every action you do to become better to hone your skill. And that's what we got to do in Everything, fasting, prayer, all that. Same, same idea. We, we got to unite that idea too. 
see. St. Gregory the Great wrote in a letter to Theotista, the sister of Byzantine Emperor Flavius Mauricius uh, a Tiberius, which is found in the collection Registrum Apostolarum, faced with the tension between monastic life and his papal office, with all the social and political responsibilities that the latter involved, he bitterly spelled out in these terms his difficulties in harmonizing contemplation and action. I have lost the profound joys of my peace and quiet, and I seem to have risen externally while failing internally. Wherefore, I deplore my expulsion far from the face of my Creator. For I was trying every day to move outside the world, outside the flesh, to drive our corporal images from my mind's eye and to regard the joys of heaven. You cast them down while they were being raised up. Psalm 72. For he did not say, you cast them down after they had been raised up, but while they were being raised up. Because the wicked and those who seem to rise up from outside, while propped up by a temporal office, collapse on the inside. And so their being raised up is itself their ruin. Indeed, there are many who know how to control external successes in such a way that they in no way collapse internally because of them. So it is written, God does not despise the powerful since he is also powerful. Job 36.5 It says uh, Gregory underscores the conflict that he's experienced and he wants to harmonize the contemplative life and the active life symbolized by Martha and Mary. The deep tension between silence and monastic peace and his new temporal duties could be resolved only by intensifying his interior life and intimate relationship with God. Uh, St. Bruno Wright wrote to Raoul Laverde, commenting on St. Luke, In any case, what benefits and divine exaltation the silence and solitude of the desert hold in store for those who love him? Only those who have experienced it can know. For here, men of strong will can enter into themselves and remain there as much as they like, diligently cultivating the seeds of virtue and eating the fruits of paradise with joy. Here, they can acquire the eye that wounds the bridegroom with love by the limpidity of its gaze and whose purity allows them to see God himself. Here, they can observe a busy leisure and rest in quiet activity. Here also God crowns his athletes for their stern struggle with the hope for reward, a peace unknown to the world and joy in the Holy Spirit. This life is the best part chosen by Mary, never to be taken away from her. I can only wish, brother, that you too had such divine love. If only a love like this would take possession of you, immediately all the glory of the world would seem like so much dirt to you, whatever the smooth words and false attractions she offered to deceive you. Wealth and its concomitant anxieties you would cast off without a thought as a burden to the freedom of the spirit. A modern uh, author wrote, Exterior silence, its special necessity in our world, in which there is so much noise and inane speech as protest and reparation against the sin of noise. Silence, not a virtue, noise, not a sin, true. But the turmoil and confusion and constant noise of modern society are the expression of the ambience of its greatest sins, its godlessness, its despair. A world of propaganda, of endless argument, vituperation, criticism, or simply of chatter is a world without anything to live for. Catholics who associate themselves with that kind of noise, who enter into the babble of tongues, become to some extent exiles from the city of God. Mass becomes racket and confusion. Tension babble. All prayer becomes exterior and interior noise, soulless and hasty repetition of rosary. And I think it's a... Uh, Matthew 15, that Christ said, Christ the Lord says uh, something about uh, uh, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching the doctrines. You know, you know the you know the line. You know you know the thing. Uh, but it's it's one of those. I think Pope Francis even brought it up. Blah blah blah. You know, just blah. You, and so it's the, the Protestant attack, the vain repetitions. Uh, there's a story of uh, in Louis de Montfort's Secret of Rosary to three girls saying a rosary, and Our Lady appears to each of them, the, and the eldest says, says it beautifully with uh, intense heart put into it and word, all the meaning in her words, and Our Lady shows with this beautiful garment on and tells her uh, 
thank you for making this garment for me. And it's very queenly and so beautiful. And she's, well, my lady, how did I, what did, what, how did I make anything for you? And she tells her, because you said my, you said rosary, as well as you are concentrating and focus on the words. And you, you offered all these roses and I made this, out of all these roses, I made this garment. And the, uh, the middle child, she comes, it's kind of like, you know, so, so maybe, uh, you know, like a simple dress, something like that. Not bad, but not, you know, queenly. And says, thank you for making this, uh, this dress for me. And she goes, uh, well, my lady, what, you know, it's not as good as the other one. And how, what did I do? What, how did, and she goes, well, sometimes you're, your mind's into it and sometimes you're not, but you still did, you didn't do terrible. So you still maybe this. And the youngest, she dressed, she showed up in rags and she, the girl was horrified. My lady, what happened? What, what, how did I do that? And she says, your, your, your thoughts and heart is never, is not into the words you say. You're just pretty much just, just saying the words just the same. You're not really paying attention to what you're doing or anything like that. So, but thank you for making this at least for me. You at least did it. So she didn't, you know, like fail, you know, like F at the repeat the class, but it wasn't an A plus plus. She wasn't summa cum laude, and so obviously this had an impact on the kids. And so for another week, they said the best rosies they ever seen in their lives. And our lady showed up again, and she, and all three of them, she dressed up queenly dresses, and you know, like you know, thank you for making this garment to each of the three. So it just goes into saying, you know, we just don't you know rattle off things just to rattle them off. We're supposed to have our, you know, mind and body, our heart all together in it. Uh, not just saying it just to say it, not being repetitive, but even just have to be able to know what you're saying and think about what you're saying and why you're saying it. I think one of the saints said, uh, talked about, you know, one Hail Mary said great is better than 300 said it just, you know, you know, willy nilly type deal. I mean, it's not bad. Still say it. You go out there whole day, you know, pray always, but you still just, you know, just not. You know, you don't just say just like you know. I'm reading the uh, menu, you're just getting it over with. You know, like it's it's three o'clock. I better just get this out of the way. It's better not doing it. But you know, just goes back to sports. If you're going to practice, there isn't. You're not going to find anybody worth their salt that was decent that said, you know what, I'm just going to go through the motions. No one's ever. If they, if you did run into somebody that said. How I practice, I just went through the motions. They didn't ever play. They they didn't make the team. And the uh, that author continued, uh, Though it is true that we must know how to bear with noise, to have interior life by exception here and there in midst the confusion, yet to resign oneself to a situation in which a community is constantly overwhelmed with activity, noise of machines, etc., is an abuse. What to do? Those who love God should attempt to preserve or create an atmosphere in which he can be found. Christians should have quiet homes, throw out television if necessary, not everybody, but those who take this sort of thing seriously. Uh, John uh, Senora writes about that in Restoration of Christian Society, how the piano used to be at the center of the living room and people would gather around it and sing and play. And Because when you're doing, you're active with a family. If you just turn the tube on, Everyone's focused on the TV and no one's focused on each other or anything like that. It's your brain just kind of shuts off and you're watching. You're getting, you don't have to worry about trying. You like read a book. You read a book, your your imagination takes over. You watch a movie, the imagination is sent to you already. You don't have to. You don't have to try. Uh, see, let those who can stand a little silence find other people who like silence and create silence and peace for one another. Bring up their kids not to yell so much. Children are naturally quiet if they are left alone and not given the needle, i.e. teased, from the cradle upward, in order that they may develop into citizens of a state in which everybody yells and is yelled at. Provide people with places they can go to be quiet. Relax minds and hearts in the presence of God. Chapels in the country or in town also. Reading rooms, hermitages, retreat houses without a constant ballyhoo of noisy exercises, and even yell the Stations of the Cross, and not too far from the Abbey of Gethsemane either. He concludes, For many it would mean great renunciation and discipline to give up these sources of noise, but they know that is what they need, afraid to do it because their neighbors would think they were bats, like batty in a sense, they, were just, they lost their minds. Modern society can no longer do without the dictatorship of noise. It lulls us into the illusion of cheap democracy which, while snatching our freedom away, 
with the subtle violence of the devil, the father of lies. But Jesus repeatedly tells us, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Interior silence is the end of judgments, passions, and desires. Once we have acquired interior silence, we can transport it with us into the world and pray everywhere. But just as interior asceticism cannot be obtained without concrete mortifications, it is absurd to speak about interior silence without exterior silence. Within silence, there is a demand made on each one of us. Man controls his hours of activity if he knows how to enter into silence. The life of silence must be able to precede the active life. In the noise of everyday life, there is always a certain agitation that is stirred up in man. Noise is never serene, and it is not conducive to understanding another person. How right Pascal was when he wrote in his Pensies, all the unhappiness of men arises from one single fact, that they cannot stay quiet in their own chamber. Today, in a highly technological, busy world, how can we find silence? Noise worries us, and we get the feeling that silence has become an unreachable oasis. How many people are obliged to work in a chaos that distresses and dehumanizes them? Cities have become noisy furnaces in which even nights are not spared the assault of noise. Think of New York City. New York City! Yeah, think of New York City. The city that never sleeps, as old Blue Eyes said. Without noise, postmodern man falls into a dull, incessant uneasiness. He is accustomed to permanent background noise, which sickens yet reassures him. Vegas is like that too. Every big city. Without noise, man is feverish, lost. Noise gives him security, like a drug on which he has become dependent. With his festive appearance, noise is a whirlwind that avoids facing itself. Agitation becomes a tranquilizer, a sedative, a morphine pump, a sort of reverie, an incoherent dream world. But this noise is a dangerous, deceptive medicine, a diabolic lie that helps man avoid confronting himself in his interior emptiness. The awakening will necessarily be brutal. I think I know people that just have the TV on in the background just to have noise in the house. So they don't want to have, they don't like it being quiet. So even though no one's watching it, there's just noise going on. The talking heads are talking. And I want to see God, Father Marie Eugene wrote again, we live in a fever of movement and activity. The evil is not simply in an organization of modern life, in the haste that it imposes on what we do, the rapidity and facility that it affords our changing place, a more profound evil, is in the feverish nervousness of temperaments. People no longer know how to wait and be silent, and yet they appear to be seeking silence and solitude. They leave familiar circles for new horizons, another atmosphere. Most often, however, this is only so as to divert themselves from fresh impressions. Whatever changes time may bring, God remains the same. And it is always in silence that he utters his word and that the soul must receive it. The law of silence is imposed on us as on Teresa. The high, strong excitability of the modern temperament makes it more urgently important and exacts of us a more resolute effort to respect and to submit to it. Silence is man's greatest freedom. No dictatorship, no war, no barbarism can take this divine treasure away from him. So in listening to you, we understand that all those silence may be absent of speech. It is above all the attitude of someone who listens. To listen is to welcome the other into one's heart. Does Solomon not say in the first book of Kings, uh, chapter 3, 5 through 15, Give me, Lord, a heart that listens. He does not ask for riches or the life of his enemies or power, but a silent heart so as to listen to God. So the Carmelite rule prescribes, quote, Be careful not to indulge in a great deal of talk, for sin will not be wanting where there is much talk. Yeah, St. James talks about that, compares the tongue to the rudder of a boat. It is a little piece of wood that allows the whole ship to be steered. The man who holds his tongue controls his life as the sailor directs the ship. Conversely, the man who talks too much is a ship adrift. In his epistle to the Ephesians, St. Ignatius 
gives the impression of severity when he discusses silence and fidelity to doctrine. It is better to keep silence and be something than to talk and be nothing. Teaching is an excellent thing, provided the speaker practices what he teaches. Now there is one teacher who spoke, and it was done. But even what he did silently is worthy of the Father. He who has made the words of Jesus really his own is able also to hear his silence. Thus he will be perfect. He will act through his speech and be understood through his silence. Nothing is hidden from the Lord. No, even our secrets reach him. Let us then do all things in the conviction that he dwells in us. Thus we shall be his temples, and he will be our God within us. And this is the truth, and it will be made manifest before our eyes. Let us then love him as he deserves. Be not deceived, my brethren. Those who ruin homes will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, if those who do this to gratify the flesh are liable to death, how much more a man who by evil doctrine ruins the faith in God for which Jesus Christ was crucified. Such a filthy creature will go to the unquenchable fire, as will anyone that listens to him. Here's a great one. In our consumer society, man incessantly struts like a peacock, but takes no care of his soul. He displays a facade and splendor clothes that wear out and are good for the moss. You can even think that in trans circles. How many of us, how many do you know that look the part? We got the, you know, smoking a pipe, smoking a cigar, got the shoe and tie on, uh, tell everybody to dress modest, tell everybody this, but then yeah, turn off the turn off the cameras and it's a different story. A couple of pages later, it says, uh, uh, Christ lived for 30 years in silence. Then, during his public life, he withdrew to the desert to listen to and speak with his father. The world vitally needs those who go, go off into the desert. Because God speaks in silence. There ain't too many desert monks out there right now. There's a few. There's a, if you look at Father Lazarus, now I, I, he's a Coptic. Uh, I think he came from Australia. I think it was an Anglican that, that converted. Uh, but he's out there in the desert. And we need more guys like that. On our, we, need, we need guys that aren't in schism doing that. But we need, we need more. Mother Teresa had an intimate knowledge of silence. She had had the hard experience of God's silence. Like St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, and St. Therese, she was a woman of silence because she was a woman of prayer, constantly with God. She wanted to remain in the silence of God. This nun did not like to speak and fled the storms of worldly noise. Mother Teresa enjoyed incredible esteem all over the world, and yet she preserved a childlike spirit. She imitated Christ in his silence, humility, poverty, meekness, and charity. She loved to remain in silence for hours at a time before Jesus present in the Eucharist. For her, to pray was to love with all her heart, with all her soul, and with all her strength. It was to give her whole being and all her time to the Lord. The most beautiful offering that she wanted to make of herself and of all her activities on behalf of the poor was to devote long intervals of her day to a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with God so that those moments of intimacy might allow her heart to swell with an unconditional love. Like Jesus, her heart always thirsts for love. Jesus' cry, I thirst, is inscribed in all the sisters' chapels of the Missionaries of Charity. Uh, he continues to write about Mother Teresa. He goes, I remember the strong, distressing words of Mother Teresa to a young priest, Angelo Camastri, who today is the Cardinal Archpriest of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. In his book, Dio scrivi dritto, there are magnificent passages. Here is his account of that upsetting encounter with the saint, which I relate here with great emotion. I telephoned the general house of the missionaries of charity, so as to be able to meet Mother Teresa of Calcutta, but their answer was categorical. It is not possible to meet Mother. Her engagements do not allow it. I went there anyway. The sister who came to open the door for me very politely asked me, what do you want? I would just like to meet Mother Teresa for a few moments. Surprised, the sister replied, I am sorry, that is not possible. I did not budge, and this made the sister understand that I would not leave without having met Mother Teresa. The sister went away for a few moments and came back in the company of Mother Teresa. I was startled and speechless. Mother had had me sit down in a little room near the chapel. Meanwhile, I had recovered a bit and managed to say, Mother, I'm a very young priest. 
I'm taking my first steps. I come to ask you to accompany me with your prayers. Mother looked tenderly and kindly at me. Then, smiling, she replied, I always pray for priests. I will pray for you also. Then she gave me a miraculous medal, put it in my hand, and asked me, For how much time do you pray each day? I was astonished and a little embarrassed. Then, gathering my thoughts, I replied, Mother, I celebrate Holy Mass each day. I pray the breviary each day. You know that these days, that is the proof of heroism. This was in 1969, before the divine office was simplified. I pray the rosary each day also, and very gladly, because I learned it from my mother. Mother Teresa, with her rough hands, clasped the rosary that she had always had with her. Then she fixed on me her eyes, which were filled with light and love, and said, That is not enough, my son. That is not enough, because love cannot be reduced to the indispensable minimum. Love demands the maximum. I did not understand Mother Teresa's words right away, and, as though to justify myself, I replied, Mother, I expected from you instead this question. What acts of charity do you do? Suddenly, Mother Teresa's face became very serious again, and she said in a stern tone of voice, Do you think that I could practice charity if I did not ask Jesus every day to fill my heart with his love? Do you think that I could go through the streets looking for the poor if Jesus did not communicate the fire of his charity to my heart? I then felt very small. I looked at Mother Teresa with profound admiration and the sincere desire to enter into the mystery of her soul, which was so filled with the presence of God. Enunciating each word, she added, Read the gospel attentively, and you will see that Jesus sacrificed even charity for prayer. And do you know why? To teach us that without God, we are too poor to help the poor. At that time, we saw so many priests and religious abandoning prayer in order to immerse themselves, as they said, in social work. Mother Teresa's words seemed to me like a ray of sunshine, and I repeated slowly in my heart of hearts, without God, we are too poor to be able to help the poor. So let us devote a lot of time to God to prayer and adoration. Let us allow ourselves to be nourished abundantly and ceaselessly by the word of God. We know the hardness of our hearts, and it takes a lot of time for it to soften and be humbled to the contact of the host and be imbued with the love of God. It was that whole pray always, pray every day. You use the Jesus prayer. You can throw, just because it's an Eastern thing doesn't mean the Westerners can't say the Jesus prayer. You can say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. You can say that a million times a day. Again, the ascetical homilies of St. Isaac the Syrian love silence above all things because it brings you near to fruit that the tongue cannot express. First, let us force ourselves to be silent. And then, from out of this silence, something is born that leads us into silence itself. If you begin with this discipline, I know not how much light will dawn on you from it. Great is the man who, by the patience of his members, achieves wondrous habits in his soul. When you put all the works of this discipline on one side and silence on the other, you will find the latter to be greater in weight. Too few Christians today are willing to go back inside themselves so as to look at themselves and to let God look at them. I insist too few are willing to confront God in silence by coming to be burned in the great face-to-face -face encounter. In killing silence, man assassinates God. But who will help man to be quiet? His mobile phone is continually ringing. His fingers and mind are always busy sending messages, developing a taste for prayer is probably the first and foremost battle of our age. Stationed in garrisons of the most pitiful noises, is man prepared to return to silence? The death of silence is apparent. God will always help us to rediscover it. And the people bowed and prayed to the neon God they made. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help myself. The soul must listen to the voice of silence. It must agree to be united with silence so as to allow God to enter into it. How do we let God enter into us? That is the question and the true grace of silence. A heart in silence is a melody for the heart of God. The lamp is consumed noiselessly before the tabernacle, and incense ascends in silence to the throne of God. Such is the sound of the silence of love. The sound of the silence in God allows us to learn the first note of this canticle, which is the song of the heavens. Quote, the language God best hears 
is silent love. John of the Cross says magnificently in his Maxims on Love. There is also what we could call the asceticism of silence. In his ascetical homilies, Isaac the Syrian wrote, quote, After a time, a certain sweetness is born in the heart from the practice of this labor, the asceticism of silence, and it leads the body by force to persevere in stillness. A multitude of tears is born to us in this discipline through a wonderful divine vision of something that the heart distinctly perceives, sometimes with pain, sometimes with amazement. For the heart humbles herself and becomes like a tiny babe, and as soon as she begins to pray, tears flow forth in advance of her prayer. The asceticism of silence reaches its most perfect degree in the life of those who have tasted this encounter with God through the contemplation of his face. This is a form of nakedness and poverty, but one gains access to true glory only at this price. The asceticism of silence allows a person to enter into the mystery of God by becoming little, like a child. The asceticism of silence is a necessary medicine, one that is sometimes painful but effective. Through silence, we leave evil behind in exchange for good. Noise has no moderation, like a ship without a captain on a raging sea, whereas silence is a paradise, like a limitless ocean. Silence is also a great rudder that can lead to a safe port. To choose silence is to choose what is extraordinary. The man who loves silence has the opportunity to conduct his life wisely and effectively. In his book, Silence Cartusian. Dom Augustine Gillerand writes, quote, The suffering of silence can be also be God's hallmark on the soul. The silence of love resembles the sounds of the angels' wings when they carried out God's commands. This silence is a love that obeys God's own silence. The silence of love corresponds to a completion, the meeting of two silences, the human silence and the silence of God that are walking along together. Gethsemane and Christ's Calvary represent the most beautiful union of these two silences. Cardinal Seurat writes, uh, In my thirst to see... Well, he's writing this whole book. By the way, if you're wondering who's writing this, this is Seurat. In my thirst to see God and to hear him, I often, I often happen to experience the solitude and the silence of the desert. When I was Archbishop of Conakry, I often isolated myself in a desert place, bathing in solitude and silence. Of course, there was vegetation all around me. I heard the birds chirping, but I had created for myself an interior desert without food or water. There was no human presence. I lived in fasting and prayer, nourished only by the Eucharist and the Word of God. The desert is the place of hunger, thirst, and the spiritual combat. It is vitally important to withdraw to the desert in order to combat the dictatorship of the world filled with idols that gorge themselves on technology and material goods, a world dominated and manipulated by the media, a world that flees God by taking refuge in noise. It is necessary to help this modern world to have the experience of the desert. There we get some distance from everyday events. We can flee the noise. The desert is the place of the absolute, the place of freedom. It is no accident that the desert is the place where monotheism was born. The desert is monotheistic. It preserves us from the multiplicity of idols that men make for themselves. In this sense, the desert is the domain of grace. Far from his preoccupations, man encounters there his creator and his God. Great things begin in the desert, in silence and poverty and abandonment. Look at Moses, Elijah, John the Baptist, and Jesus himself. The desert is where God leads us in order to speak to us in his heart-to-heart -heart conversation. But the desert is not only the place where men can experience the physical tests of hunger, thirst, and total destitution. It is also the land of temptation, where Satan's power is manifested. The desert teaches us to fight against evil and all our evil inclinations so as to regain our dignity as children of God. It is impossible to enter into the mystery of God without entering into the solitude and silence of our interior desert. Persons who live in noise are like dust swept along by the wind. They are slaves of the turmoil that destroys their relationships with God. On the other hand, those who love silence and solitude walk step by step towards God. 
they know how to break the vicious circles of noise, like animal tamers who manage to calm roaring lions. Dom Augustine Gilliran again in Silence Carthusian, uh, writes these magnificent lines, as again as Cardinal Seurat, quote, For us Carthusians, the words that we do not say become prayers. That is our strength, and we can do some good only by this great method of silence. We speak to God about those to whom we do not speak. Remember that, remember that song? People speaking without speaking. He continues, It is necessary for us to have no more fear of ourselves or of others. It is necessary to look real life in the face. This profound, prolonged look is what God will give us. For God is at the basis of everything. This desire or this love is what we seek. This is where God calls us. One arrives at this point only after a long journey that separates us from creatures and from ourselves. The great science is the great light. Here below is silent love. In silence, sadness is looking at oneself. Joy is looking at God. This is why we have silence. It is necessary to get out of oneself, to think of God, instead of thinking about self. Infallibly, silence leads to God, provided man stops looking at himself. For even in the experience of silence, there is a snare, narcissism and egotism. Silence requires absolutely availability with respect to God's will. Man must be completely turned toward God and toward his brethren. Silence is a quest and a form of charity in which God's eyes become our eyes and God's heart is grafted onto our heart. We cannot stay in the presence of the fire of divine silence without being burned. The friends and the lovers of God are irritated by him. The more they remain in silence, the more they love God. The more empty of self they are, the more full of God they are. The more they converse with God face to face, the more their faces beam with the light and splendor of God, like Moses coming out of the meeting tent. Sarar continues, uh, Silence is a paradise, but man does not see this right away. He is full of contradictions. We ought to be like children in God's presence, but we try in so many ways to make our relationship to God difficult and obscure or even non-existent. Man has lost the simplicity of childhood. That is why silence is so difficult for him. And man rejects silence even more because he wants to become God himself. In silence, he cannot be a false God, but can merely stand in a luminous face-to-face -face encounter with God. In the confession, St. Augustine confides his own experience through these magnificent lines. Late have I loved thee, O beauty, so ancient and so new. Late have I loved thee, for behold... Thou wert within me, and I outside, and I sought thee outside, and in my unloveliness fell upon those lovely things that thou hast made. Thou wert with me, and I was not with thee. I, I was kept from thee by those things, yet had they not been in thee, they would not have been at all. Thou didst call and cry to me, and break open my deafness, and thou didst send forth thy beams, and shine upon me, and chase away my blindness. Thou didst breathe fragrance upon me, and I drew in my breath, and do now pant for thee. I tasted thee, and now hunger and thirst for thee. Thou didst touch me, and I burned for thy peace. Ultimately, where are the dwelling places of solitude and silence? Sarara continues, Noise surrounds us and assaults us. The noise of our ceaselessly active cities, the noise of automobiles, airplanes, machines outside and inside our homes, besides this noise that is imposed on us, there are the noises that we ourselves produce or choose. Such is the soundtrack of our everyday routine. This noise unconsciously often has a function that we do not dare admit. It masks and stifles another sound, the one that occupies and invades our interior life. How can we not be astonished by the efforts that we constantly make to stifle God's silences? Noise is a desecration of the soul. Noise is the silent ruin of the interior life. Man always has the tendency to remain outside himself, but we must ceaselessly come back to the interior castle. We discover the noise painfully when we decide to stop what we are doing to enter into prayer. Often the great din colonizes our interior castle. The modern world has multiplied the most toxic noises, which are so many malignant enemies of peace of heart. In a secularized materialistic and hedonistic world, in which wars, bombs, and submachine gunfire, acts of violence and barbarism 
are the common currency where assaults on the dignity of the human person, the family, and life affect people at their very core. Respect for silence has become the least of humanity's worries, and yet God hides himself in silence. In a conference dealing with the sound of silence in the, in the holy desert, <laughs> the sound of silence, Carmelite brother John Gabriel of the infant Jesus rightly commented, reading the Desert Fathers in this way, you would be tempted to believe that life in the desert is full of sweet conversations with God, with no other care but this holy laziness, whose loving contemplation John of the Cross describes in his spiritual canticle. Most often, however, the hermit is confronted with the darkness of his sinful soul. Silence and solitude are the place of a spiritual battle against his three enemies, the world, the devil, and the old man, or the flesh in the Pauline sense. Which is the most stubborn of the three, if we are to believe John of the Cross? There is a sort of glory of silence. This is again Sarah, setting Nasir Loyola, did not hesitate to write in his spiritual exercises, quote, The more the soul is in solitude and seclusion, the more fit it renders itself to approach and be united with its Creator and Lord. In his book for self-examination, the philosopher Soren Kierkegaard summed up the problem explicitly and brilliantly. If, in observing the present state of the world and life in general, from a Christian point of view, one had to say, it is a disease. And if I were a physician and someone asked me, what do you think should be done? I would answer, the very first thing that must be done is create silence, bring about silence. God's word cannot be heard. And if in order to be heard in the hullabaloo, it must be shouted definitely with noisy instruments, then it is not God's word. Create silence. Uh, everything is noisy. And just as a strong drink is said to stir the blood, so everything in our day, even the most insignificant project, even the most empty communication, is designed merely to jolt the senses or to stir up the masses to crowd the public noise. And man, this clever fellow, seems to have been sleepless in order to invent ever new instruments to increase noise, to spread noise and insignificance with the greatest possible haste and on the greatest possible scale. Yes, everything is soon turned upside down. Communication is indeed soon brought to its lowest point with regard to meaning. And simultaneously, the means of communication are indeed brought to their highest with regard to speedy and overall circulation. For what is publicized with such hot haste and, on the other hand, what is greater circulation than rubbish? Oh, create silence. During the general audience on November 22, 1995, John Paul II declared, Mary's example enables the church better to appreciate the value of silence. Mary's silence is not only moderation in speech, but it is especially a wise capacity for remembering and embracing in a single gaze of faith the mystery of the Word made man and the events of his earthly life. It is this silence as acceptance of the Word, this ability to meditate on the mystery of Christ that Mary passes on to believers. In a noisy world filled with messages of all kinds, her witness enables us to appreciate a spiritually rich silence, and fosters a contemplative spirit. Hear this faint, continuous noise that is silence. Listen to what we hear when nothing makes itself heard, wrote Paul Valeri in Tel Quail. This is the motto of the Virgin Mary. This is the motto of the strong woman. This is the motto of a silent woman. The silence of the Virgin is not a silence of stammering and powerlessness, it is a silence of light and delight. It is a silence more eloquent in the praises of God than eloquence itself. It is a powerful and divine challenge in the order of grace. And Cardinal Sarah talks about after uh, she moved in with John. So we can imagine that she lived in silence and in a profound peace. She meditated often on the passion of Jesus the wonderful summit of their common missions. The more time passed, the more silent, recollected, and contemplative she became. She prayed and fasted. She joyfully accepted so many sacrifices in order to extend the passion of her son for the salvation of the world. Her prayer was a perpetual silence in God.
I guess you could say it gets in a little controversy in the uh, chapter Silence, the Mystery, and the Sacred because it talks about the Mass. And uh, one uh, uh, paragraph 237, at the beginning of our Eucharistic celebrations, how is it possible to eliminate Christ carrying his cross and walking painfully under the weight of our sins towards the place of sacrifice? There are so many priests who enter triumphantly and walk up toward the altar, greeting people left and right so as to appear sympathetic. I remember seeing priests, I remember in Columbia, uh, one priest greeted the head coach of the South Carolina Gamecocks and was smiling on the way in. You know, people, I've seen that many times. You know, you know everyone's probably seen that. Uh, do, 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 do. Just look at the sad spectacle of some Eucharistic celebrations. Why so much frivolousness and worldliness at the moment of the holy sacrifice? Why so much profanation and superficiality given the extraordinary priestly grace that renders us able to make the body and blood of Christ substantially present by the inv invocation of the Spirit? Why do some think that they are obliged to improvise or invent Eucharistic prayers that conceal the sacred prayers in a wash of petty human fervor? Are Christ's words insufficient, making it necessary to multiply merely human words? In such a unique and essential sacrifice, is there any need for such a display of imagination and subjective creativity? In praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Jesus warns us in Matthew 6, 7, Many fervent Christians who are moved by the passion and death of Christ on the cross no longer have the strength to weep or to utter a pain, a cry of pain to the priests and bishops who make their appearance as entertainers or set themselves up as the main protagonist of the Eucharist. These believers tell us nevertheless, we do not want to gather with men around a man. We want to see Jesus. Show him to us in the silence and humility of your prayer. And it goes in, in 2011 and during a World Youth Day in Madrid, Pope Benedict XVI was supposed to address the young people from all over the world during the Great Vigil. As he was about to speak, a storm arose and there was a cloudburst. The Pope waited with the young people for the storm to calm down. Finally, when the weather became more clement, a master of ceremonies brought the Holy Father the speech that he had prepared. But the Pope preferred to use the remaining time for the essential thing. Instead of speaking, he invited the young people to enter with him into the silence of adoration. Kneeling before the Blessed Sacrament, Benedict XVI preached by his silence. There were more than a million young people behind him, drenched to the skin, standing in the mud. Nevertheless, over the immense crowd reigned an impressive sacred silence that was literally, quote, filled with the adored presence. It was an unforgettable memory, an image of the church united in great silence around her Lord. Sarah, bring, Sarah brings up, let us learn to keep silence even in the midst of suffering. Today, there are many who howl with the wolves to defend a view of the liturgy, of which they want to be the sole custodians. These ideologues noisily immolate on the altar of their idols those whom they consider reactionary. God willing, may their idols breathe with the sweet-smelling aroma of their sacrifice. It seems to me that silence veils the mysteries, not to hide them, but to reveal them. The mysteries can be uttered only in silence. Thus, in the liturgy, the language of the mysteries is silent. Sarah continues, uh, Celebrating Mass facing east by breaking up the face-to-face -face private get-together helps to prevent turning the liturgy into the community celebration of itself. On the contrary, when we turn towards the Lord, the liturgy allows us to return to the world with a new impetus and a truly missionary strength so as to bring to it not our poor, hollow, noisy experience, but the one word heard in silence. The next paragraph, he goes, I refuse to waste our time pitting one liturgy against another or the right of St. Pius V against that of Blessed Paul VI. Rather, it is about entering into the great silence of the liturgy. It is necessary to know how to be enriched by all the Latin or Eastern liturgical forms that give a privileged place to silence. Without this contemplative spirit, the liturgy will remain an occasion for hateful divisions and ideological confrontations instead of being the place of our unity and of our communion in the Lord. 
it is high time to enter into this liturgical silence turned towards the Lord, which the council intended to restore. What I am about to say now does not contradict my submission and obedience to the supreme authority of the church. I deeply and humbly desire to serve God, the church, and the Holy Father with devotion, sincerity, and a filial attachment. But here is my hope. God willing, when He wills, and as He wills, the reform of the reform will take place in the liturgy. Despite the gnashing of teeth, it will happen, for the future of the church is at stake. To ruin the liturgy is to ruin our relationship to God and the concrete expression of our Christian faith. The word of God and the doctrinal teaching of the church are still heard, but souls that desire to turn toward God and to offer Him the true sacrifice of praise and adoration are no longer impressed by liturgies that are too horizontal, anthropocentric, and festive, often resembling noisy, popular culture events. The media have totally invaded the Mass and transformed it into a spectacle, when actually it is the holy sacrifice, the memorial of the death of Jesus on the cross for the salvation of souls. The sense of the mystery disappears through changes, permanent adaptations that are decided on, autonomously and individually, so as to seduce our modern profane mentalities that are marked by sin, secularism, relativism, and the rejection of God. In many Western countries, we see the poor leaving the Catholic Church because she has been taken by storm by ill-intentioned persons who make themselves out to be the intellectuals and despise the little ones and the poor. For this is what the Holy Father should denounce loudly and clearly. For a church without the poor is no longer the church, but a mere club. Today in the West, how many empty closed church buildings are destroyed or redesigned for profane use, regardless of their sacral character and original purpose? Nevertheless, I know that many priests and faithful Catholics live out their faith with extraordinary zeal and fight every day to preserve and enrich the houses of God. We must urgently rediscover the beauty, sacred character, and divine origin of the liturgy by remaining staunchly faithful to the teaching of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. In a conversation with Father Amante, Charles Cardinal Jaret tragically declared, quote, Liturgy and catechesis are the two jaws of the pinchers in which the devil wants to steal the faith away from the Christian people and seize the church so as to crush, annihilate, and destroy her. Even today, the great dragon is keeping watch on the woman, the church, ready to devour her child. Sarah continues, It is sad, and almost a sacrilege, to hear occasionally priests and bishops chattering incessantly in the sacristy, and even during the entrance procession, instead of recollecting themselves and contemplating in silence the mystery of the death of Christ on the cross, which they are preparing to celebrate and which ought to inspire in them nothing but fear and trembling. Silence is therefore by no means absent from the ordinary form of the Roman rite, at least if priests follow its guidelines and celebrate in the spirit of its recommendations. Unfortunately, this is Cardinal Seurat, unfortunately, too often we have forgotten that the council includes silence as part of the active participation also, which promotes truly deep personal participation, allowing us to hear interiorly the word of God. Now, in some liturgies, no trace of this silence is left. Apart from the homily, all other speeches or introductions of persons should be forbidden during the celebration of Holy Mass. How, if you go, to, if you've ever been to a Noah's Ordo Mass, they usually after, sometimes after communion, uh, priests will sit down. All of a sudden, you know, you're supposed to be meditating, you know, giving Thanksgiving, and Father gets up and starts giving the ads out of the bulletin. I remember one priest giving the sports scores. A friend of mine told him, hey, Father, until ESPN starts saying a Hail Mary, lay off the sports scores. Uh, but yeah, you, you, there's time after communion, you're going to have a uh, priest give you, hey, don't forget, dogmas and donuts after Mass today. Uh, by the way, we just got a new uh, principal, you know, whatever. Hey, let me introduce Sister from Nigeria to talk, to talk on X. You're trying to give Thanksgiving to God. Go back to the uh, Mother Teresa thing. Uh, and you're doing social justice stuff. After instead of thanking God for what just happened, communion in 
everyone's sitting down, crossing their legs. Hey, we're forgetting about whatever's going on. And after they get done with their five minutes of ads, kind of like a commercial break of the mass, it's, all right, now let's everyone focus again, get back into silence in a sense, and we'll give you a final blessing. And then afterwards talk, which I have every to a T. Uh, there was one time there was somebody that comes back, there's kids come back and they're just yapping right next to us. Talk about inconsiderate. You, you don't do that at the library. But in this, they would come back and they start yapping. I had to tell them, hey, guys, could you give us, we're in, it's hard to pray when you guys are talking. And you're like, well, God would want us to talk. Fine, get outside. <laughs> Just, did you even listen to the sermon? At least the sermon talked about it. But I mean, sometimes you got the priest going, I told my wife about this the other day. You know, for the here, you know, they talk about this Eucharistic revival. Well, all right, let's sow some action. It's kind of like what happened at the World Youth Day with the, with the, the Ikea bowls and the plastic wrap. You can't have a Eucharistic revival if you don't act it. You can words, yap, 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 and not even try to do anything, all right? We're trying to do a Eucharistic revival, but we're still doing communion in the hand, facing the crowd, and then, uh, you know, talking, yapping it up after communion. All right, you're not serious. Sarah continues, Today, we often get the impression, as Nicola Bux states in his book on Benedict XVI's reform, that, quote, Catholic worship has gone from adoration of God to the exhibition of the priests, the ministers, and the faithful. Piety has been abolished as a word and liquidated by liturgists as devotionalism. But they have made the people put up with liturgical experiments and rejected spontaneous forms of devotion and piety. They have even succeeded in imposing applause on funerals in place of mourning and weeping. Did Christ not mourn and weep at the death of Lazarus? Ratzinger rightly observes, quote, Wherever applause breaks out in the liturgy, it is a sure sign that the essence of the liturgy has totally disappeared. At, you, at most parishes you go to, if they have something used you at the, during the commercial break after communion, they'll end up saying, hey, we just hired somebody else. We just did this. Here's sister, blah, blah, blah. Oh, hey, let's thank the choir in the back. And give the, you know, kind of like at the movie. Let's give the credits and everyone's going to applaud. What would be your fondest wish concerning the place of silence in the liturgy? Sarah, I call Catholics to general conversion. Let us strive with all our heart to become in each of our Eucharistic celebrations a pure victim, a holy victim, a spotless victim. Let us not be afraid of liturgical silence. How I would love it if pastors and the faithful would enter joyfully into this silence that is full of sacred reverence and love for the ineffable God. How I would love it if churches were houses in which the great silence prevails that announces and reveals the adored presence of God. How I would love it if Christians in the liturgy could experience the power of silence. He continues, uh, asceticism is a means that helps us to remove from our life anything that weighs it down. In other words, whatever hampers our spiritual life and, therefore, is an obstacle to prayer. Yes, it is indeed in prayer that God communicates his life to us and manifest his presence in our soul by irrigating it with the streams of his Trinitarian love. And prayer is essentially silence, chattering the tendency to externalize all the treasures of the soul by expressing them is supremely harmful to the spiritual life. Carried away towards the exterior by his need to say everything, the chatterer cannot help being far from God, superficial and incapable of any profound activity. Just wrapping this up, this is in the conclusion section of the book. Uh, towards the end, uh, God's first language is silence. In her book, In the Heart of the World, St. Teresa of Calcutta declares that, quote, we need to find God, and he cannot be found in noises and restlessness. God is the friend of silence. The more we receive in silent prayer, the more we can give in active life. We need silence to be able to touch souls. The essential thing is not what we say, but what God says to us and through us. Jesus is always waiting for us in silence. In this silence, he listens to us and speaks to our souls, and there we will hear his voice. In this silence, we find a new energy and a real unity. God's energy becomes ours, allowing us to perform things well. There is unity with our thoughts, with his thoughts, of our prayers, with his prayers, of our actions, with his actions, of our life, with his life. If you open the door of a furnace, the heap will escape from it. This is Sarah again. 
Quote, beware of gossip, says St. Dorotheus, because it causes pious thoughts and meditation on God to flee. It is certain that a person who speaks incessantly to creatures will have difficulty speaking with God, and for his part, God will speak little to him. Thus, says the Lord, quote, I will bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. The book of Proverbs says, When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is prudent. Uh, Proverbs 10, 19. St. James is unequivocal. The tongue is an unrighteous world. St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi thinks that someone who does not love silence cannot appreciate the things of God. Very quickly, he will throw himself into the great furnace of the pleasures of the world. The virtue of silence does not mean that we must never speak. It invites us to remain mute when there are no good reasons to speak up. Ecclesiastes says, There is a time to keep silence and a time to speak. Ecclesiastes 3, seven. Referring to these words, St. Gregory of Nyssa remarks, quote, The time to keep silence is mentioned first because by silence we learn the art of speaking well. When, therefore, should a Christian who desires to become holy be silent? And when should he speak? He should be silent when it is not necessary to speak, and he should speak when necessity or charity requires it. St. Chrysostom gives the following rule, Speak only when it is more useful to speak than to be silent. St. Arsenius acknowledges that he often regretted having spoken, but never regretted having kept silence. St. Ephraim says, Speak much with God, but little with men. Saragos, I encourage everyone not to forget these few bits of advice. If in your presence someone uses inappropriate, sinful language, leave that gathering if possible. If circumstances oblige you to stay, at least lower your eyes and remain silent or seek to direct the conversation towards another subject. That way, your silence becomes a protest against sickening chatter. When you are obliged to speak, weigh well what you intend to say. Make balances and scales for your words, says the book of Sirach 28-25. As for St. Francis de Sales, he colorfully remarks, quote, In order to avoid faults in speech, we should have our lips buttoned so that while unbuttoning them, we may think of what we are going to say. It is time to revolt against the dictatorship of noise that seeks to break our hearts and our intellects. A noisy society is like sorry-looking cardboard stage scenery, a world without substance, and immature flight. A noisy church would become vain, unfaithful, and dangerous. Asceticism fosters a life in accordance with the interior logic of the gospel, which is that of gift, especially the gift of self, as the natural response to the first and only love of the life. In a word, this is his final line, in a word, God or nothing, because God is enough for us. Uh, anyway, get the book. Uh, you, you're going to like it. Uh, I've only got a few chapters left to go. I skipped a ton of pages, obviously. It's a you know, 250 pages, roughly, 240, 220 pages. So, anyways, like I said, get the book. I'll have the link underneath in the show notes. Uh, I wish I could have got him on to do this. That'd be great. But you have to put up with my uh, chattering. So, in light of the book, I will stop talking and get the, be silent for the rest of the day. And hopefully, uh, <laughs> hopefully my words weren't uh, like silent, silent raindrops fell and echoed in the wells of silence. Though in the in the one paragraph or stanza of the uh, song of silence, you can have uh, you can think of what the Cardinal Sarah just did. Uh, it's his words: "Hear my words that I might teach you; take my arms that I might reach you." But my words, like silent raindrops, fell and echoed in the wells of silence.